Welcome to the Airborne Mind Show. I am your host, Ms. Bahawk, and in these conversations, I like to explore what mental frameworks drive people to do what they do. I have strong feelings about talking to people who are deeply entrenched in and passionate about their work. I've always been drawn to ideas, art, and people that have a perspective that I can learn from. And so along the way, we're going to share and explore ideas that leave you with more context. You'll pick up things that might be educational, empowering, inspirational, or simply entertaining. And because you're listening, I have a free gift only for podcast listeners that you can grab if you head over to MizHQ.com. Again, that's M-I-Z-H-Q.com. Today, my guest is none other than uh, Phil White. He is the co-author of several game-changing titles in health and fitness. Uh, Some of the books you may have heard of because we've had some of the guests on the show, uh, Unplugged, right, with Brian McKenzie, Dr. Andy Galpin, uh, Waterman 2.0 with Kelly Sturette, and several others. I was fascinated by Phil because I know that behind any creative work of art, there are dozens of habits that people don't see, right, that you you abide by to be able to create that art. There are uh, hours and hours of, of time spent, you know, working on such minute details and, and things behind the scenes that you may not really uh, get to know, right, because you're going to experience that finished product, that, that package that we're receiving, which is that book, the words on the page, um, the words of these you know, industry leaders distilled down into something that we can consume, um, you know, in a way that's so helpful. So I wanted to know a lot of, you know, what goes into, you know, his work creatively and and the types of things that he uses to feel that. So that was really fun for me. Um, You know, if you're looking to support two wonderful organizations, uh, Phil actually works in a pro bono capacity with CAMO, which is an organization that helps veterans overcome TBIs and PTSD, and also The Last Well, which aims to bring clean, disease-free drinking water to every man, woman, and child in Liberia by the end of 2020. All this good stuff is linked in the show notes, so be sure to check that out. Um, Also... My apologies ahead of time. We, uh, I, I, there was some stuff that was kind of cut out in in the beginning of the episode. We got on such a roll talking off air that, uh, you know, we we carry that into when we were recording. So there's like a couple minutes in the beginning that, uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, are lost. <laughs> but uh, it, I, I assure you that it does not, um, you know, it, it won't kill the rest of the conversation. So, uh, hope you enjoy being in the room with us. Um, Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. And more importantly, hope you do something with it. There's a great storyteller, as a lot of Irish people were. And so while my grandfather was fighting in France in World War II before uh, he got shrapnel in both hips for, from a grenade and, and had to be evacuated out, and that was the war done for him, um, she was working in Woolworth's department uh, store in London and... She talked about how her and the other, I guess at the time that they were, they were known as shop girls, like literally girls who worked in stores, right? Mm -hmm. How they, you know, all in their late teens, early twenties, and they, they would not go into the bomb shelter. They would just go, go in the back room and, um, and drink tea and have a chat while the air raid sirens were going out. And, and I said, well, Nan, (laughs) that doesn't sound very safe. Like when when Hitler and co are bombing London, like, why did you do that? And she said, well, we heard that that Winston Churchill, um, who obviously, (laughs) anyone doesn't know that name, I I have fears for you, but (laughs) prime minister at the time, um, that often he didn't go down to the shelters. And so we we kind of viewed it as solidarity with with Winston. And then she proceeds to tell me that the department store next, next door to them ended up getting bombed out at a wow. certain point in the war in the blitz and so she would just weave these incredible stories and she told it a lot better than i did and so just that passion for storytelling and seeing that my mom um was a writer and and some of the work that she produced and then just the interaction between them and the generations and um and my uncle is 
maybe not a good storyteller, but certainly you're one of those uncles that's a good joke teller, particularly once he gets a couple of pints of Guinness in him. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and really just there's something about Celtic people, I think Irish and Scottish people, and um, my nan is from Belfast, and there's a, they just have a way in a certain, um, and, and that's a positive stereotype, I think, but uh, whether it's Fergus Conley, you know, my, my cohort, my co-conspirator on our book Game Changer, or... A good friend the last couple of years has, has become um, Darren Dillon, who is the performance director for Shamrock Rovers um, Soccer Club in Dublin. They just have a way and an ease about them in storytelling. And I, I just thought, I want to be a storyteller like, like them. How did you begin to dive into that process? Because storytelling, uh, it's something that it's so primal, one, right? But then there's so many mediums that... Uh, mm. express it in different ways, you know, like uh, the first thing that came to mind is, oh, there's storytelling even within uh, sometimes a podcast that you do, right? Like a certain certain arc that you go through throughout the episode to get to know the person who's on. Or there's a certain uh, storytelling aspect of things when you're talking to your friends or you're reading a book or an article. Um, what was kind of your uh, your process to mm. start to learn kind of that craft? Well, the biggest, uh, I had a great mentor and professor who ended up actually keeping my um, my wedding rings um, in his uh, attic, <laughs> but a, a guy named Tyler Blake, and um, he was extraordinarily strict in his standards and just demanded excellence. And then I had another um, teacher who I've tried really hard and failed to get in contact with called John Lucas who taught at Gillingham School um, in Dorset in the UK, where I'm from. And at age 15, um, I wasn't getting very good grades and I was kind of bored by school. And, and, and you've probably heard this from Brian McKenzie and several others of my friends who you've had on that um, school didn't challenge them. And it was, you know, they felt like they were being forced into the matrix, you know, yeah. kind of <laughs> down a certain path. And but But Mr. Lucas, really a history teacher, actually, really just um, one taught me about source work and bias and all of that, but just just demanded excellence. And then in college, as I said, Tyler Blake, my English professor, my advisor, really picked up that torch and took it to a new level. And, um, you know, um, I, I've had editors in the in quotes real world in the job world that have been far less exacting and demanding than either of these gentlemen. And so, um, yeah, so really that. And then my my best mate growing up, Luke Kreisel, called me one day. And I measure things by how old my kids are. And so Johnny is going to be 12 in February. So he was probably one and a half, two years old. And I was working full time. So I'm out of college. I was writing for a tech company. And, um, you know, when you have a toddler, things get crazy. So I get a call from Luke and he says, hey, mate, you know that book I'm working on? And I said, yeah. And he, he was working on a book with uh, the Scratch DJ Academy in New York, which was, of all things, founded by Jam Master Jay from Run DMC before he passed away. And he said, well, you know, my dad's been sick. And I said, yeah. And his uh, his dad actually uh, had stomach cancer at the time. And so Luke was having to go back and forth between his home and and, um, and workplace in New York, uh, fly into London, drive the two hours southwest to where we're from, spend a bit of time with his dad and reverse the process and go back. And, and he said, well, here's the deal, mate. I've I've got to have 80,000 words in three and a half months or I'll be in breach of contract with my publisher. And I have 800 words. Can wow. you help? And I had never written anything beyond maybe 3,000, 4,000 word paper. And so now he's saying, can you do 80,000 words for me and do it in three and a half months with a toddler and with a full time job and a bit of freelance I was doing for magazines on the side at the time, including his. And so, um, yeah, really just um, talked to Nicole, my wife, about it. And she was like, well, um, I don't know how you're going to get it done, but if you know, I, I know you're passionate about writing, so I'll support you. And so that involved her taking Johnny, my son, and my mother-in-law's house at the weekend and me working all weekend. I worked every night until three or four o'clock. I remember one night I was I was up till five thirty a.m. talking with Z Trip, who is a DJ, kind of a mashup DJ out in California, and uh, just these amazing, you know, Jazzy Jeff. Uh, Grandmaster Flash, Paul Oakenfold, all these amazing DJs and creators, both on the hip hop and electronic music side. And somehow um, Luke and I and, and Rob Principi, who is um, the CEO of the, the Scratch DJ Academy, managed to bang out that book. And from that moment, 
I knew I could do that. And then from there, it was just game on. Yeah, that is fascinating. And I want to bookmark that because we're going to come back to how you were able to uh, begin to tackle that task of 80,000 words and then how that process has maybe evolved over time. But first, I'm, I'm curious to know um, what draws you to collaborating and working on the projects that you have worked on? Um, because when we take a look at some of you know your recent work, like uh, Unplugged with Dr. Andy Galpin, Brian McKenzie, Waterman 2.0 with uh, Kelly Sturette, um, and you know the 17-hour fast. What what is it about each of those that uh, maybe there's a common thread? You know that maybe moves you to um, be like, oh yeah, this is a topic or this is an area that I want to dive into, and these are the people that I want to do it with. Um, what does that kind of internal thought process for you look like? A combination of enthusiasm, um, curiosity, wanting to learn um, from the best in the world. And then also just a, I'm very passionate about serving others. And sometimes this takes the form of, you know, donating my writing to, to charities. So for example, I'm involved with a nonprofit called The Last Well, um, which is aiming to be the first nonprofit to bring border to border clean drinking water to an entire nation which in this case is um, Liberia by the end of 2020. So if I can shamelessly plug them at thelastwell.org, that's a very uh, noble cause. And then I also do some work with, uh, with a lady called Emily Hightower um, up in, in uh, Carbondale, Colorado, and she works with an organization called CAMO, and they um, primarily help veterans who have TBIs and PTSD with trying to, to recover and get their life back together. And a lot of time they find their marriages falling apart. They lose their kids, um, you know, as a result of these traumatic brain injuries, say their convoy gets blown up by a roadside device in Afghanistan. And really Emily and John and the folks up there try to put them back together again. And so um, really just being able to do some pro bono work with those folks is something that's really important to me. But then even beyond that, I, um, I, I just view myself as like the conduit between what is in Kelly's brain, Brian's brain, Fergus, Andy, you know, Frank Merritt, these others um, who you mentioned, and an audience who can benefit from their work. And in reading, hopefully what we create together, they can make meaningful change in their own life. And if we move the, the, the needle for one individual by one degree, then I think we've done our jobs and, and I've provided that service both for the reader and for my co-authors. That's yeah. Well, first of all, would love to get those uh, resources that you mentioned linked up in the show notes and support how we can. Um, but I, I I wonder about you know when I was looking at the um, you know the first couple sentences of. I'm trying to think which book it was. It may have been The 17-Hour Fast. You know, uh, I'll read a little excerpt of it. It said, this book is dedicated to anyone who has faced failure and initially thought, I can't. Then defiantly stood back up and said, yes, I can. My best friend Jason was given only months to live, but courageously he, his wife, and his friends teamed up and said, we can beat this. And we did for over seven years. And you went on to talk a little bit more about Jason and we got into his story and got to learn more about him as the book went on as well. But does that personal connection fuel a lot of your writing, you know, in combination with the enthusiasm that you have for maybe a certain topic or, or the people that you're collaborating with? Um, how much of that personal connection is something that you look for when you are taking on a project or as you are going through a project? Yeah, well, I think with that, it, um, Frank Merritt, anyone that's read Unplugged would have heard from him and uh, his head coach, Brandon Rager at Vitality Pro in that. And so I, you know, through Brian McKenzie, that's the connection. They became friends. And, uh, you know, I got a call from Frank one day basically saying, you know, here's the full story behind our company and what we do. Like I gave you some of the performance stuff for Unplugged, but here's the real story. And, um, you know, I, I want to honor my my commitment to, to my best friend, Jason, who made me promise right before he passed away from from brain cancer that we would not 
um, keep to ourselves these protocols that we use to to not only help him outlive his prognosis of maximum of six months, but um, he lived seven years and was able to have two kids despite chemo, which obviously creates fertility problems often and was able to practice law right up until the end and be a good husband and dad and a good friend. And um, Jason looked looked Frank in the eye as they were rocking in their chairs on on the front porch one day and said, Frank, you have to promise me that you're going to share the, the, you know, this fasting and these other things that you've done to help me with others. Like this story cannot stop with me. I want it to just begin with me. And when he told me that story, which, um, you know, forgive me for getting emotional a little bit. My, my, my wife's, um, father, John passed a year and a half before, before I knew her, before I first knew her. And, um, it was the same kind of brain cancer. And, and we just thought, well, <laughs> you know, if we had known what we know now through Frank and through this fasting protocol and some of these other techniques that maybe we could have saved his life or at least given him more life and more vitality. And so, yeah, I mean, that to me seems a lot more like a mission than a job. Yeah, that that has to – it's always amazing when you dig deep within within – a body of work that appears to be, you know, one thing to, to a consumer, but then you can get into the layers and see like, huh, what is it really that made this so important or gave you this enthusiasm or this fuel to really be relentless kind of in your pursuit of creating it and then sharing it with the world. And, and, and now I'm, I'm thinking, when you sit down like that first project that you mentioned where, you know, you had to write 80,000 words and several projects after that i'm sure you you you've taken on that have challenged you in a similar way what what how would you describe your role when you sit down uh to take on something like that you know like hey help me write 80,000 words how do you even begin to wrap your head around um hey this is going to be the process this is where we're going to start um that behind the scenes aspect of this type of creation is really fascinating to me so i'd love to hear kind of how you organize that in your brain when you take on a project like that yeah and that's a really good question so with that book because they had a publisher saint martin's press which you know is jocko willink's publisher and that you know big publishing company in new york one of the biggest in the world and they, you know, had already accepted the book. The deal was in place. There was, as a part of that, an extensive proposal, including a pretty firm chapter list or table of contents. And between Luke and, I mean, Luke got Moby to write the forward or, or he ghost wrote the forward for Moby, who obviously, you know, is multi Grammy winning, you know, multi platinum recording artist and DJ and producer. So, that was already in place. Um, and they really had then a wish list outside of the people that Rob and Luke didn't know that we thought, oh, okay, on the hip hop side, Grandmaster Flash would be great, great to get, you know, on the electronic side, you know, someone like Above and Beyond or Pete Tong or BT. And so um, there, there were these documents in place. And so what I realized pretty early on is we need that structure. So now say Kelly and I sit down to plan Waterman 2.0, we just come up with we have a couple of conversations and out of that I come up with a provisional table of contents or again a list of chapters. And then from there I really say, okay, you know, the next conversation is let's um or maybe two, three, four conversations, let's figure out maybe five to seven main subtopics or talking points for each of these, say, ten, you know, chapters one through ten. And once we have that in place and we go back and forth a bit, you know, then from there, I just interview them around it. I start at the beginning introduction, like kind of setting the scene, how we got to now put it into context, you know, um, maybe add a little bit of Kelly's story. So in Waterman 2.0, how did Kelly get to now? Um, and, you know, a large part of that book to me that was so, so great was his. Yeah, a lot of people don't know Kelly was on the Whitewater National Slalom Canoe Team. You know, he was a waterman himself um, until the day his hand went numb and he couldn't feel from his fingers all the way up to his neck. And he went to his coach who said, man, it's just what happens. We're paddling twice a day, 300 days a year, a lot of volume. You know, you probably buggered up your shoulder, your neck. Just go get surgery. Your place on the team will still be here if you want it when you come back. 
Kelly was like, well, what do you mean that's just what happens? You know, and also that the only solutions are a life of shoveling painkillers like it's his second religion um, or surgery or both. And, and that didn't sit too well. So he set out to fix himself. And in the process of PT school and learning to fix himself, he then, just because he's such a giving guy and wants to help others and has that same service mentality I mentioned earlier, dedicated his life to using what he had learned to help other people. Not a lot of people know that. So again, like you said, let's get to the real heart of the matter. So with Frank, it was Jason's story. Um, and how that, that then related, you know, he challenged me to write um, about a man I've never met, but I've heard stories from, from my wife, from my brothers-in-law, Dave and Randy, from um, my mother-in-law, from their family friends about what a great guy John was. And, oh, John did this and John said that. And just see the marks of a, a generous life of this big hearted guy with a big Christian faith who lived out his faith, you know, and um so that, you know, Frank challenged me to tell that side of the story, which we then twin with Jason's story in in the 17 hour fast. But then again, with with Kelly, it's like, what can we do a little bit different here? Who is Kelly Starrett beyond mobility ward, beyond, you know, this this big, big guy who when you meet him in person, like he, he towers over me and makes me look like a little kid next to him, you know, big, strong, tough guy. But if you get to again to the heart of the matter, who is this guy? Where does this what is his mission and where does that come out of? What What is his story? And the same in On the Record, the DJ book, like Grandmaster Flash talks about how his dad was so serious about his record collection. This is going to sound terrible, but I'm going to tell you anyway, that he he would know if his kids got into his vinyl and he would literally hold their hands over the radiator in their New York City apartment until they started to blister and as a reminder to never touch his turntable and to never touch his vinyl, which is obviously terrible and abusive. But yet it was in those sessions where his dad would go out to work and the kids would be at home and they put all, on all the records because they love music so much that they thought that punishment was worth it. it yeah. The Grandmaster Flash became this hip hop icon and this godfather of this movement that has now swept the world. And again, that's getting to the heart of the matter. This isn't me just saying, oh, when, when did you get your first record deal? You know, and asking these dull, lazy questions. How do you get to the heart of the matter? Because ultimately people connect to people and they connect to stories. They, do, they, they don't connect to breathing protocols and mobility prescriptions. And if anyone thinks that any of these books are about that, they are not about that. They're about getting to the heart of the matter. Yes, and and I love that because I I believe that transcends uh, what we're talking about, and even in you know if we were to draw the example of uh, fitness and nutrition, right? Some of the same protocols scientifically that might be going around can be a little more effective when you hear it from somebody who you resonate with a little bit more. Maybe it's their story of how, you know, the struggles that they had or the challenges that they faced that for whatever reason draw you closer to that person. And you may just hear things slightly differently, even though somebody else is saying the exact same thing, but it has a different tonality to it. It comes from it comes from a different perspective or there's a different story behind it. So it's fascinating to see how powerful, you know, that that art can really be in in terms of um, almost being kind of this this vehicle, right, for educating or or uh, passing on information. It can, it can enhance, I think, the quality of it, or not the quality, but maybe the effectiveness of it, right? It can be ten times more effective when they're, like you said, you get to the heart of the matter and you can paint that picture. Yeah, I think so. And I think, you know, with Waterman 2.0, we can say it's a movement manifesto for surfers, paddlers and rowers. OK, well, that's a decent tagline. But really, what I would say is it's if you want to know if you like Kelly Starrett or are curious about him and how he got to where he is now and who he is today, um, even how he met his wife read the book because it's Kelly's story. And then we just and it's also the story of Laird Hamilton, of Kai Lenny. Um, of the Jackson family of Jackson Kayak uh, fame and their stories as well. And it's really a collection of stories. Oh, and by the way, there's some mobility exercises in it, you know. So I think maybe even how we describe the book on Amazon or what have you needs to change. Because to me, 
even just hearing Kelly's story and being have, him having the level of trust in me as a caretaker of that. Brian McKenzie, tr Andy Galpin trusting me enough that when they speak to me, that I'm going to do justice to their words because, you know, sure, they edited it, but they're busy guys. You know, Andy's teaching, Brian, Brian has Art of Breath, Power Speed Endurance, etc. Frank Merritt is a is an emergency room, like a trauma room physician down in Florida. <laughs> he, he, he has to be present at work or people can die. Like, he can't be editing what I write. So just the... The, I wouldn't say the weight of responsibility on me, but I, I take this really seriously. And I think um, I actually like Stephen King's book on writing better than I like Stephen King's books because I'm not into horror at all. But he, I think he said it in that, like about writing. If, if, you, if, if this doesn't mean something to you, and I'm going to butcher this, but we'll go with it, then go, please go and do something else because – storytelling matters like it matters to me and it matters to your reader and you owe them something so nowadays i hate how we have like senior content specialists at companies like their title should just be storyteller or something pretentious like storyteller in resident because to me content in quotes is me trying to sell you something and or my boss has this list of seo keywords that they paid a marketing consultancy 25 grand to come up with so we can get better search engine rankings on Google. That, that's what content is, okay? It's hollow and frankly, it's bullshit, if you'll pardon my French, versus what we're talking about and what Stephen King is talking about in, in on writing, which if you haven't read it, go read it. Um, storytelling that, that comes, for, you know, gets to the heart of the matter and the person creating it, like this is what gets us up in the morning and keeps me up till 2, 3, 4 a.m. when I have a one and a half, two-year-old to write a book that I have no clue if I can even finish. And it's I'm not just doing it out of a debt to my friend Luke Kreisel, who parentheses is probably the greatest feature writer of his generation. Um, if your ears are burning, Luke, deal with it. Um, but, you know, in all seriousness, like this matters. Like we're not curing cancer here and, I, and I'm not going to be too self-important about it, but, but it, it matters so freaking much to me. And when I see my kids sitting there writing or doing comic strips or creating little videos to tell stories, that that kind of gets me a lump in my throat because I think I, I'm hopefully teaching them a lesson. Like you, you're not going to go to college and do a four year business degree. And not that there's anything wrong with that. If you're an entrepreneur, you want to go start a business, that's your thing. Great. But my thing is writing and my thing is creating and doing it from a place of passion and also responsibility. And if I can pass that on to my kids a little bit, at least then I've moved the needle in my own home, not just in hopefully someone will read one of these books and it will fix a problem in their life or help them improve their, their health or their performance or whatever it is. So, yeah, I take this thing really seriously. And let's stop talking about content, people, because that's bullshit. It's it's storytelling or it's nothing because otherwise it's just search engine optimization. Yeah. And, and you hit on something really interesting there, which uh, is the story can come in different mediums, right? So you were saying comic strips or videos that they're creating to tell stories, or maybe it is writing. Uh, and even within writing, there's so many different expressions of it, right? Um, so how, if any, you know, from what you've studied about storytelling and what you've learned, are there certain fundamentals that you would say carry over into um, across the board. So, uh, you know, what you used some of the principles to write the book, what you use when you're telling a story to your friend in day to day conversation, uh, what you see your kids doing, and how they're implementing certain things, maybe within storytelling, like what are if you were to give us one to three things that we should we should keep in mind um, to to use storytelling to the best of our advantage, what are some things that kind of come up for you? There is, um, I think that really curiosity you know, on my part drives conversation. And out of that comes copy or words, right? Fancy word for words. And so really that kind of three C's model, I guess, if I was going to package it up, which again, just sounds like the bullshit I was just talking about. But <laughs> if you had to distill it down, curiosity and a little arrow goes, goes to conversation. 
which then goes to copy, right? And then it, it really just, there are, I wrote a book about Winston Churchill, okay, <laughs> of all things called Our Supreme Task back in the day. Um, my tagline should be writing books that nobody buys since uh, 1997. <laughs> but anyway, so this was one of them. But it's a story of how he ended up in this tiny little town in in Missouri called Fulton and the Iron Curtain speech that he gave there at Westminster College. And so I told it through the eyes of the college president, Frank Bullitt McClure, and how on earth this guy at this tiny little liberal arts school in the middle of nowhere managed to get the most famous guy in the world in 1946 to come to his little town, right? And what I learned about Winston Churchill was precisely what you just said, that how he spoke at the dinner table or to his wife as they were walking through their garden or in the Houses of Parliament, or in the thousands of magazine articles he wrote, or the dozens of books that he wrote, was was the same. There was congruency there, and there was integrity there. And part of the reason is, if you've seen the movie Darkest Hour, and if you haven't, I don't know what you're doing with your time, go see it now. Um, he, it is because he dictated everything from about age 19 or 20. He didn't write himself because he realized it was inefficient. And so to me, in writing Game Changer, um, Fergus Connolly and I had a period of about two weeks, uh, probably three summers ago now, where he just talked at me like seven hours a day. And I would just ask a few open ended questions. And it wasn't willy nilly. We were going against the table of contents that he kindly came up with. Very detailed. He's a really organized guy, a brilliant guy. But um, out of that, then out of the transcripts from that, those are copy and pasted by my humble self into a Word document. And then I just write around it and fill in the gaps. And so the fact that I use those conversations verbatim and just clean them up a bit and write some transitions means that there is an integrity between what Fergus Connolly or Kelly Starrett or any of the people we mentioned um, between what they would say if you were in this kind of conversation with them um, and if they were talking to their family or friends or if they were coaching a class live or it doesn't matter if they were <laughs> in their living room, if they were you know, addressing the executive team at Google, um, na a team of Navy SEALs, whatever it might be, um, you know, or a casual conversation. There's integrity because what I do is I, I, I try to ask open-ended questions that elicit genuine heartfelt responses. And then I use that not just as the basis for these books and my writing, but as the 90% of the whole bloody thing. And that's kind of the secret. Um, and, and then and I either transcribe it myself by hand or my poor, long suffering, good lady wife, Nicole, sometimes does it or when I can afford it, which is not often. I use Rev, R-E-V dot com. And it's a dollar a minute. So I'm not making enough money off these books, bro, to do this every day. But regardless, even if I just go off my my notes or I transcribe the audio, it, it, this is the Winston Churchill approach that I discovered in writing Our Supreme Task. But I'm not dictating to a secretary. I'm recording the conversation. I'm transcribing it. And I'm taking very detailed notes that nobody could read. And that means that, as I said, there is just that congruence there, that integrity. And it's truly their story. Like when you read this stuff, this isn't me trying to show off, oh, well, he's such a good writer or whatever. No, it's their words. And then I just try to connect them in a way that tells a story. I am so uh, pumped that you brought this this up because it's something that um, I've experimented with and I've thought about a lot as well because when I mean in in the uh, the realm of stand-up comedy being able to be more conversational on stage and being able to riff and and basically talk right into let's say uh, even if it's just into a recorder you're doing yourself there's there's if you did that for let's say seven minutes just to get words going and a stream of consciousness kind of getting out there there are bits that you can find within those seven minutes that can turn into material. Even if it's not fully fleshed out, it can give you some basis. And and what this makes me think of is, uh, you know, there's a certain pressure sometimes that can come with, oh, I'm sitting down to write and I need to come up with something brilliant versus like you're saying, you ask somebody a question that's genuine and curious 
And the answer that you get is going to be a lot more natural. Uh, it, it may be a lot more expansive because they're not physically thinking about writing it down and how it looks on paper, but it's just flowing out. And then like you said, you can always go back and actually transcribe it into something that, uh, you know, you can mold however you want, I guess, into into a story structure or uh, however, you know, you want to kind of connect things together. So uh, it's so great to hear that that's something that, um, you know, you hold in high regard as being able to uh, basically talk and then transcribe from there. Yeah, and let's be clear, when I'm writing something for myself, if it's not co-authored, this doesn't work, and I do not speak it into a microphone or a, as, as old folks would call dictaphones, you know, or any, or into my iPhone, because um, one, I think people in the coffee shop where I work every afternoon would think I'm insane. <laughs> <laughs> and, and secondarily, and probably my wife as well, but um, beyond that, I just don't feel comfortable with it. And so for me, I I can win the day if I title a word document and then copy and paste that and save save you know save it as whatever i just wrote the title as and the title often doesn't remain as it is but literally if i can title a document and save it in word i've already won the day because from that point i get caffeinated as you can probably tell because i talk too much and talk too fast but i um and then i just write so to be clear this is not something i do when it's my own stuff unless it's an, a piece that features an interview in which case it gets transcribed. I paste it into the Word document again. So it's my interview subjects words. And then and I write around it because I also write, you know, for um, I do some ghost writing for, for companies like Train Heroic, um, for Laird Hamilton's company, XPT, etc. And for TRX. And that often doesn't have my byline. And I kind of like that being behind the scenes a little bit because it kind of fits with the service aspect. But when you're dealing with somebody at the level of Nick Gill, who is the strength coach of the best sports team of all time, the New Zealand All Blacks rugby team, I cannot in all good conscience mess around with Nick Gill's words or put words in his mouth. So when I interview Nick for Train Heroic or I interview someone like Tim DeFrancesco, um, someone at that level, or even if they weren't, but somebody at that level um, it, that is absolutely the best in the world at what they do. I owe a responsibility to them and to someone who sees, oh, Nick Gill, oh, All Blacks, e even for the All Blacks themselves. And not that I'm trying to put myself in the story because all of those guys would kick my ass, probably want to if they hear this. But, <laughs> you know, silliness aside, um, just the name, the All Blacks, you have a responsibility to them. And I have the responsibility to my friend Nick Gill to do right by him. And how do I do that? Well, I ask open-ended questions, I listen, I write them down, and then I copy and paste in what he says, and I just clean it up a little bit and put a tiny bit of structure around it, and hopefully he's happy with it. And that's why there are usually not many edits to these things, because the words literally come out from out of their mouth through me as a conduit or a channel and onto the page and then out to the reader. And that, to me, has the most integrity versus me trying to write something I have a supposition. I try to get a quote that backs that up, which we do with data all the time, right? Confirmation bias. I don't want a confirmation bias piece with Nick Gill's name on it, with Tim DeFrancesco's name on it, with Darren Dillon's name on it. I, I want it to be what they said to a T and to, to have come out of their mouth and it to be as close as it was spoken to me as it physically can be on the page or on that website or whatever it might be. Because that to me is what, authenticity looks like within this it seems like listening is such a huge huge part of your ability to be able to to convey that effectively right um how how do you view like what's the mindset you have to put yourself in because we hear this all the time right it's like oh be a good listener in, in even day-to-day -day conversations you're having with people but in, in the form of like interviewing specifically and where you're kind of searching for i'm sure certain parts that speak to you or that that resonate with you what is that listening process like for you you know what mindset do you have to put yourself in to be able to uh spot those moments where you're like, yep, that's it. That's something I'm going to use. And, and, and I'd love to hear a little bit about, um, how you frame that in your own mind. 
Mm, that's a good one. I think I try to, I read a lot of these books, right? So, you know, some of my favorites, David Epstein's The Sports Gene, um, anything by Stephen Kotler, you know, The Rise of Superman, probably one of my top five books. Um, you know, Peak Performance by Brad Stolberg and um, Steve Magnus, and then stuff like The Big Short by Michael Lewis, which I don't give a crap about the financial markets. My 401k wouldn't keep me in coffee until tomorrow afternoon. Um, and if I get run over by the bus, uh, bus tomorrow, my wife and kids are going to be destitute. But uh, again, silliness aside, I, as a reader and as somebody who reads an awful lot and really appreciates good writing, um, I, I just look at it for a reader's eyes. If I was going to pick up this book, flick to a random page and read the few pages or the chapter based on this conversation, what would I want to know and why? And that's it. That's the only answer I could give you. That's that's my lens when I'm preparing for, for these interviews with co-authors, with people I'm ghostwriting for on blogs. Um, that anything, all of the above, any kind of writing I do, what what would I want to know as the reader? I just try to put myself in their shoes because I am the reader and these are the kind of books I buy. When you take that and you think about, okay, I have I have these couple lines or this this whole, uh, th these few minutes of, of brilliant explanation around something that we want to keep. Now, what do you do in terms of cleaning it up or structure how about that lens what are you looking for there to make sure that it's 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 exactly how you want it to uh it's exactly how you want to articulate and convey it well often it's not and that's the problem isn't it because i think the great historian david hackett fisher said it best where he said history is not you coming up with a theory or a thesis and then going out on Wikipedia and find, or even to a library, you know, for us that are old school and hand wrote their papers all the way through college like I did. But um, who we actually had to work for a living, you know, particularly <laughs> as writers, like talk to Stephen Kotler about that sometime, about the source work that was needed back in the day. But uh, again, um, I, I think that often I hear things that completely explode my preconceptions. And then in a book, say, I have to go and restructure that chapter and the talking points because they no longer fit what we agreed on. Or, you know, Brian has just learned something new about breath work or Kelly is, has talked to someone like Gray Cook and has changed his mind on something. And so just that openness, being willing to change your mind and to be rejiggering re on the fly and to be able to actively listen enough in the moment to think, oh, shit, like this whole chapter just went to crap. How do I pivot? And sometimes you can't. And sometimes you have to be like, huh? And you just level with them. Like, hmm, that's not really what we talked about last year when we were planning this thing. Um, let me rally. And can I call you, you know, what are some open times for tomorrow or the next day where we can dive back in? And I have to scurry away and go rejigger re the chapter, re-interview them. But often, I mean, it doesn't happen often. I often I'm able to pivot in the moment and, and see, okay, well, if that, then what does that mean for this concept? Or does this also disprove this? And I think even in research, you could spend an entire day trying to disprove one of your central points. And to me as a writer, like people ask about writer's block a lot. And, and I say, if your only goal is to advance the ball, it doesn't matter. Writer's block doesn't exist for you because it could be that you just you have that one conversation that either, like I said, just blew up your brain or you're talking to a veteran who is describing the scene when a roadside bomb went off and the aftermath of that. And you say, I was at the coffee shop hearing this and I was planning to work for another three hours. And I called my wife with a lump in my throat and said, just briefly recapped it. She would not want to know the details. And um, and I just said, I'm just emotionally done for the day. I'll be home in 30 minutes, which is my walking commute home. And so you just have to come into a conversation open to whatever comes and you cannot lead somebody down a road to what you want to hear. Because, again, there's no congruency or authenticity in that. And sometimes if you are living with open hands and you're interviewing that way, it, you're going to get knocked on your ass, either cognitively, um, emotionally, spiritually. Um, you've just got to be open to surprises and knowing that that means the process is going to take longer for this book or this project, but so be it. Editors can adapt. 
That's really interesting. Yeah. So you're saying, um, you think when you, cause how you think about questions is something I'm interested in because that is something that you mentioned is so big, right? Is, is you asking a question that elicits, uh, an authentic, genuine response and 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 sometimes that gives you the opportunity to take that and do something with it so you're saying you know asking asking or formulating a question that you think is going to lead somebody down a certain path or certain answer that is not the approach uh the other side of it is is coming from a place of genuine curiosity and i guess with that it seems like there there is some risk um you know, a risk of vulnerability maybe that, that can come with this, which is like, oh man, what if, you know, what if there's a better way to ask this question or what if this is the wrong question or what am I really trying to get at here? I mean, how do you handle that? How do you, how do you think about, um, you know, yeah. How do you think about phrasing and kind of getting your question across, uh, in a way that is going to, um, I guess be be genuine coming from you and also I guess make enough sense or resonate with the person you're asking that question to that they are able to freely give you this this genuine authentic response. I think it comes down to not being lazy and, and doing your homework. So example, we talked a little bit offline about how Ben Harper was my first ever cover story and knowing that from his agent, they basically said, never ask him about his family. And if you do, the interview is over. Um, it's almost like, just try it, see what happens, you know, but yeah. don't. Um, and respecting his music and him as a creator so much and as a human being so much that I, I didn't, again, want to screw it up when, it, you know, there's a magazine cover bearing his face, that it should be his words and they should be meaningful. So I, I just went back through every interview that I could find with Ben for like the la the previous year online thank goodness this was you know was in internet days not in pre because I don't know how you would do that at a library unless they had you know 10 years of the New York Times or something but anyway so I um really just spent hours and hours and hours reading through these these articles and just jotting down in my notebook questions that I thought weren't asked. So somebody asked a great first question and then Ben gave an answer that I thought would naturally lead down a certain path, but they never asked the second question. Or it was just lazy, like, how does this out how is this album a progression for you? Or how is it different to your last album? He gets asked that like 20 times a day when he has a new album coming out. And here's a guy that's won again multiple Grammys and all the awards under the sun and, you know, has this amazing body of work. How bored do you think he's going to be if at 6 p.m. Um, on, a, on a Friday, I'm the last bastard that's interviewing him for this particular press junket for this new album? And I say, Ben, how is this album different than your last album? And he's not only heard this five times previously that day, but he's heard it five times a day for the last few weeks. And how bored is he going to be? And what kind of stock answer is his brain to save energy, as the brain always tries to do, is going to spit out? Versus if I find out, like, say, with um, what the heck was this? It's a bad anecdote when you have a terrible memory. There's an album that he did where they recorded it, him and the Innocent Criminals, in Paris in like five or six days, or even the gospel album that he won a Grammy for with the Blind Boys of Alabama. I think they went in the studio with like three songs and they came out with a full album in two days and they recorded it all analog, which is why it sounds so amazing. Like Ben, why did you decide to go analog for this album is a bit of a better question. Or what was it like working with a guy like Clarence Fountain who had grown up at the time Clarence was like in his seventies and recently passed away, but um, the leader of the Blind Boys of Alabama what was it like, grow, you know, working with someone like like Clarence who had grown up under the oppression of, you know, this legacy of slavery? Um, I think pretty sure his his dad picked cotton in a field and, and you know, has been through the civil rights movement um, and just the, the weight of gospel music. Like gospel music has very little to do with church or where you spend your Sunday mornings. Like how did this you know, this legacy that this heavy legacy that, that Clarence was trying to to continue the legacy of gospel, gospel music. And it, and it was coming out of a place of pain for him and his fellow band members. 
how did you bear the weight of that responsibility with this album? Like, that's a really windy, long question. I probably asked it a bit better. But I think, you know, I'll arrogantly pat myself on the back a little bit that that's, and say that's a better question than, how is this album different than your other albums? That's lazy. Like, yeah. go and learn. Okay, so I learned he had just released this album, um, which is one of my favorite albums with the Blind Boys of Alabama. Oh, never heard of them before. Who's that? And you go off down these tangents. Oh, what are their stories? What? what oh, wow, these guys are... I'm glad he did it before they passed away because they're all pretty old. You know, what what does their five decades in music look like? What does their time in the civil rights movement look like? And, and you go down these and, and this is dozens, if not, you know, maybe 100 hours of research. Because luckily I got the assignment and I had like three weeks of lead time until I actually did the interview. And um that enabled me to not be lazy. Like I was given the blessing of not being, you know, of having the time to really do my research. And so anytime I do an interview, um, I just try to, even if I don't have that time, I'll look at the last, I'll go on Google, I'll restrict it to the last month at Ben Harper interviews, Ben Harper Q and A, Ben Harper podcast, and hopefully they transcribed it, you know, so there's notes, but, um, and then just do it like that. So you can accelerate that. You don't need weeks or hundreds of hours of research. You can sure condense it, but really go in with a list of eight to 10 questions. And then beyond that, I just see where the conversation leads me because they may not want to go down that road. Uh, but at least I come in with eight to 10 where I'm like, these are rock solid questions. and I'm pretty sure nobody has asked them these at least in the last month and hopefully not in the last year, if at all, if ever. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it seems like, well, one, within asking these types of questions, within the listening, within the writing, the, the common thread seems to be that there's a certain level of uh, being in the moment or being present that you kind of have to bring to the table. Um, and I know that's another one that we hear all the time, right, on top of like active listening is, hey, be present, be in the moment. Uh, what has been your approach to navigating around that, you know, getting yourself, if you've got to write the 80,000 words, you know, being able to sit down and crank away uh, for however long you have to per day, or being able to really listen to what somebody is saying and to ask good questions. Um, yeah, the, the level of focus and, and, and being present you have to bring to these tasks, what has been your, your maybe ritual for, for achieving that, if any at all? Yeah, so I think it's partly environmental design, you know, and, and um, Magnus and Stolberg in, in Peak Performance do a great job of describing this. And I, I can't wait for their next book, which hurry up, guys, I want to read it. Um, but they and even Stephen Kotler, too, talks about like Google Stephen Kotler flow triggers or flow state triggers. And if you have the money and you're a creator, go to Stephen's Flow for Writers camp, which you can find the link to on the, the Flow Genome Project website. Because, yeah, it's expensive, but what you can get from Stephen for three and a half grand is better than you can get from any college on the face of the planet for 150 grand. So let's redefine what we think about as value with this kind of stuff. So, um, so Stephen, in both the course or even Creative Live, you can take Stephen's like flow for creatives or whatever it's called on Creative Live's website. Mm -hmm. For I think it's on sale right now for 90 bucks. That is the best $90 you will ever spend if you are a creator or if you're just someone who wants excellence and flow in what you do every day. And so go do it. That That's like the entry ramp. Go, go do it and go buy The Rise of Superman. And um, yeah, for... 15 bucks, you buy the Rise of Superman, you take Stephen's course for 90 or 100 bucks, and you've now got a toolkit for environmental design and for hacking into flow states, which are really just those times where you're you're really vibing on something and four hours pass, and you're like, holy crap, how is it 4 p.m. already? I thought it was 1 p.m. Guess I better go get some lunch now, you know? Mm. And so, you know, the times where we're just, we're, we're really at our most productive, we're at our most engaged, we're at our most focused. So, Stephen Kotler is your man for all of that stuff. And so beyond Kotler, I think my own process. So I, I really like this little Scottish headphone company. They make in the ear headphones. So I guess earphones, whatever they're called, earbuds, um, called RHA. 
And so I have a pair of their headphones, um, just started playing around with the wireless ones. I prefer the wired ones. So they block out pretty much everything, like way better than an over the head headphone, like the Bose or whatever people use. Um, so I, I cannot write or edit to, or, or even research to, to music that has lyrics. So there's an electronic music composer called BT, um, which anyone in the UK is like, well, isn't that our phone company? Well, yes, it is. But um, be, check out the musician. BT is a lot better for you for this kind of thing. And then there's um, another musician, another electronic music composer from the UK called Max Cooper. And I have, and there's another guy, another Max, Max Graham, who is not DJing right now. He's taking kind of a break, but a Canadian guy, lovely guy. And they, they make these great, um, almost mid-tempo, I don't know, the BPM range is like 120 to 125. And so I haven't really got into binaural beats and all of that stuff, you know, all the psychology around that. But I'm guessing it's similar. It's just the right tempo for me. There are no words. And I have the same playlist just on repeat. And so this is similar to what Michael Phelps does. The, the comfort in routine when you saw Michael Phelps before a race with his giant headphones on for an entire at least year, if not Olympic season, he had three or four of these playlists that were the same because there's too, as Fergus Connolly would say, there's too much chaos that will occur on game day, whatever game day means for you. And that's the same if you're in the corporate world. It's the same if you're in arts or sciences or whatever. There's too much chaos that occurs for you to have bandwidth to deal with it if you're worrying about Spotify coughing up the next song and you don't like that. And then the next song, oh, crap, I don't like that either. So none of this randomness, none of this going back to the iPod shuffle BS. Get your playlist that you can focus to and that disappears. You, you forget that it's playing for me. So then from there, as you can tell by the, my rambling, I get really, really caffeinated. Um <laughs> I have an espresso machine at home. And then also Stephen Kotler told me something really profound and it's like sponsored by Stephen Kotler. Um, he's not paying me to say any of this. So Brian McKenzie is good mates with him. And if anyone's read Unplugged, hopefully they notice Kotler's tips in there in, in the back of the book. Um, I think they're just after Tim Ferriss's, which were also really good. So Kotler told me, he said, you know, I have this friend who said, Stephen, I... <sighs> Can you help me with some, understand something because I'm confused on it? Like you, you and Jamie Wheel are banging out like a book um, every year and a half. Um, you are running two companies. You have you and your wife have your, your sanctuary for abused or abandoned dogs. You seem to spend all your time surfing or snowboarding. Anytime I talk to you and I can't get you, you say, "Yeah, sorry, I was on the slopes or I was at the break or whatever." Um, how do you fit everything in? Like you, And also, how much of your time do you actually spend outside? And so he figured it out. And he figures out that he spends up to a third of his waking hours every day outside, whether it's walking with his dogs or it's, you know, being active in some way, skiing, snowboarding, surfing, whatever, just going for long walks. Um, and his friend said, OK, OK, I, I, now I'm really confused. So you're saying that that only leaves you with, you know, X number of hours of waking time a day to work. So how are you able to do that when you spend you're doing all that stuff and you spend that much time outside? And he was like, the outside time is how I do everything else. Wow. And so he, every afternoon, unless there's, you know, a scheduling, my wife's sick, I have to pick up the kids from school or they're home and I'm, I'm trying to spend time with them or the end of this year, I'm shutting it down for 10 days, you know, and so friends and family time around Christmas for, for once. But um. Yeah, I, I think that every day, you know, Monday to Friday outside of that, probably 90 percent of those days, I walk two miles from my house through our little town here in Colorado. No traffic unless an elk uh, walks in the middle of the road and decides to just stand there for a while. Um, it's two miles. I go along a lake, which I paddle pretty frequently. Um, I go through the, the forest and it's two miles ish to the coffee shop. And when I get there, like my brain is so freaking lit up from that walk that I'm just ready to crank and go into my se second big session of the day. Um, and, and again, I used to think before I had this conversation with Stephen Kotler for Unplugged that, uh, oh, I don't have time today. Or, oh, well, if I do this, I'm re a real slow walker. It drives my wife nuts. Um, she's like, you know, way ahead of me on the trail. I'm like, hurry up, old man, you know, and um, <laughs> gives me crap about too much white hair in the beard and such, which is true. But um, yeah, again, uh, nonsense aside, I... I used to think, oh, crap, I'm only, you know, going to take me 30 minutes, maybe 40 if I bump into a friend, which I quite often do. 
um, maybe 50, you know, if we talk for a long time. So m maybe say an hour is gone each way on this walk. So that's two hours out of my day. How can I even justify that? And then, oh, shoot, you know, X, you know, co-author or Y interviewee kept pushing back our morning call. And because I was waiting for them to text me and I'm on tenor hooks, like, oh, no. Oh, can we give it another half an hour? Oh, sorry, mate. I need another hour. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I, so I just burned all of my morning and I had one shorter than I wanted conversation. Right. And now I'm looking at this afternoon. I want to go play basketball with my kids. So I've got maybe two and a half hours left. Am I really even best case? Can I really dedicate one hour of that to a 30 minute walk out and a 30 minute walk back? Wouldn't I be better just staying in my home office is where I'm talking to you from now and just making that all in quotes productive time? And Kotler's answer was no, you would not. And here's why. Because being out in nature gives you the flow triggers of novelty, of complexity, of unpredictability, and probably several others that end in E. And then um, and those are when you get to the coffee shop, that hour is going to be so much more productive than you, if you had sat in your home office or I actually stand, um, if you stood in your home office, had stared at the same screen you've been staring at from 8 or 9 in the morning, and you'll probably be staring at until 3 or 4 a.m. because he knows me. He goes early, I go late. Um, so no, actually, you're looking at it all wrong. Go on your walk, get there, do an hour of focused work, turn your phone off or just don't take it with you, and crank for an hour and then come and plug back in with your family and you will be all the better for it. And, and it, and it was like revolutionary to me. It's just changed everything. That's so amazing. I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, I've, I've been exposed to some of Stephen Kotler's work, but, uh, the course you're mentioning on creative live, I'm a big fan of them and I'm curious to, uh, check that out. You said it was called flow triggers. Um, it's something called like flow for creatives and then the more expensive in-person course, which is with Stephen in, in person. I think the next one is um, in early December in San Francisco is a two day deep dive into everything from how to write a six figure book proposal that will be likely accepted by publishers to how to overcome writer's block to the kind of stuff I just described. And yeah, just um if I can ever afford it, I'll be there. <laughs> yeah. But it would be money very, very well spent. But yeah, the, the kind of 101 level from Professor Stephen Kotler is Creative Live, and I think it's called something like Flow for Creatives. And as of today, it was on sale for 90 bucks on Creative Live's website. So yeah, I mean, are you kidding me to have access? And even like Masterclass, you know, you look at Creative Live, you have, you know, someone like Chase Jarvis or obviously founded Creative Live or Chris Burkard, mm -hmm. you can learn photography from them for $90. Or you can you can learn film directing from Ron Howard on Masterclass for $90. Or, um, you know, <laughs> music production from, you know, who, whoever this amazing artist is. Like we, I, I bash technology a lot and I think we're way too uh, reliant on it and dependent on it. But the access that we now have to some of these people, like imagine, you, you know, this conversation plays out. So, Oh, so are you still trying to get into film directing? Um, yeah, yeah, I am actually. I um, I actually just took a took a pretty good course on it. Oh, um, who was your teacher, or you know, what, what was it? You know, ex college or you know, nearby, whatever. No, Ron Ron Howard was the was the professor. Sorry, say that again. <laughs> Ron Ron Howard was the professor, as in like the film director, Ron Howard. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and then parentheses, and if you want to go take it, it's $90, and you can learn on your own time, and it's like 32 hours of amazingness. So yeah. you're saying it's $3 an hour to learn from Ron Howard, or from Stephen Kotler, or from Ken Burns on documentary filmmaking. So man, like <laughs> the learning we have at our fingertips now, not just through this real-world apprenticeship I have with the Kelly Starrettes and the Brian McKenzies and the Dr. Andy Galpins, but, but through you know the best people in the world at their thing. It's right there. So stop posting on Instagram right now and stop pissing away three hours a day on social media and your phone and actually go learn something from one of these guys, you know, or girls. Yeah, it, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, Masterclass, Creative Live, uh, those platforms, what they've what they've done to be able to uh, bring expertise from all these different people that we admire in different mediums and expressions and you know, sometimes gathering some of their, uh, potentially some of their best work or some of their most, uh, 
some of the best work relative to you know what you're going to resonate with and what's going to move you forward within whatever creative project you're getting into uh it's yeah, there's no question about it. You know, it's about kind of thinking about the value that you're going to extract from this. And I think you you compared it earlier to like, you know, 150 grand for for 4 years versus like, you know, 3 grand 2 days with Stephen Kotler and the amount of knowledge you can absorb from that that will actually instantly probably help you move forward and get moving on whatever creative project you have. Uh, there's no doubt about it. There, there's something, uh, I feel like it's still undervalued um, today in terms of in how we're looking at some of the information and knowledge that's being passed around. Definitely. And even I just, um, I dropped like $400 on books in the last month. And that's not to say, oh, look at me with my big research budget. But I'm co-writing a book with Aaron Alexander, who um, has the Align Therapy podcast and is excellent. Actually, check out his interview with Kotler on that. It's a really good recent one. But um, so I, I'm looking at my stack of books and I got This Is Your Brain on Music. I've got The Healing Power of Sound. I've got The World Beyond Your Head. I've got Blue Mind. I've got Movement Matters from Katie Bowman. I've got, let's see, The Blue Zones, The Blue Zones Guide. I've got a Seagull book on meditation. I've got this freaking thing, like right before Kenny Kane and I went off of um, Instagram and social for this kind of 30-day fast that we're almost done with to um, to inform like a four or five part um, article that we're doing for, for the body of knowledge. Um, it, the last thing I think I posted on Instagram was a stack of books Um for research for Aaron, for Aaron, Aaron Alexander's book. And actually that was about <laughs> a third of what he ended up buying. But even um, on the back end of that, just from the lifestyle component of that book, I, I had read it a couple of years ago. Um, Jason Ferruja recently mentioned it to me again as a book that's really influenced him. And then Tom Foxley, who's a uh, Mindset Rx in the UK, a good friend, mentioned it again recently to me. And just the book Essentialism by Greg McKeown. So my wife looked at me and was like, yeah, there's another book in your office that came from Amazon today as if to say, uh, have you not spent enough this year on books or even the last six weeks? And I sure have. But Essentialism by Greg McKeown, I think it's 15 bucks on Amazon in hardback or go to your local bookstore, even better, pick up a copy, have them order it if they don't have it, support local, you know, as I should have, but um, I didn't. I needed it quick. So even just <laughs> like the mindset that Greg McKeown shares in that of, is this project you're considering going to advance the ball for me? Yes or no? Or is it in fact just going to sap what little time and energy I have left or prevent me from waiting for a while and seeing how things develop or maybe taking the real opportunity and seizing that and running with it, you know, a few months from now that I, I, the thing I really want to do and, and doing that from, from a posture that is not a fearful one of, oh, I'm not going to have enough money if I don't say yes to this new client or whatever. And just realizing like you will be provided for if you're pursuing your passion. And just that kind of mindset that I got from essentialism. I'm, and I'm now diving back in. And again, I'm grabbing a specific quote from it that I want to use in this book. And I couldn't remember where it was and how I would use it for Aaron's book. But um, just invest 15 bucks. Like you don't even have to do the, the creative life rise of superman and do what it says you know <laughs> buy a bible and do what it says as best you're able buy essentialism by greg mckeown and do what it says or even like jocko willink you know um buy his first book with leaf babin um extreme o ownership and learn how to prioritize your tasks and then execute prioritize and execute and and just even teaching my middle schooler how to start time blocking on his calendar and how to start being more organized he yesterday said, don't worry, daddy, I'm going to prioritize and execute on this homework. And I was like, Jocko just taught him something through me that cost me 12 bucks because I bought Jocko's book. You know, like yeah. you don't need to invest very much. And I think Ramit Sethi was the one that said, never, never debate back and forth for days or weeks about whether you're going to buy a book or something, because it likely you're going to take at least one thing from it. And that one thing, if you actually hold on to it and implement it, is going to be far, far more than the price of admission. Oh, 100%. I, I'm with you on that. Um, well, Phil, thank you so much for what you have shared with us today. You've given us such insight into uh, the creative process, into how to produce great work, how to think about storytelling. And I think 
it gives us it gives us a different perspective if we've never thought about it like this before but when we're consuming you know different art whether it's in the form of books or videos or movies like there's just a different level of appreciation that you can have for it once you hear some of the intention that that goes on behind the scenes so thank you for uh you know sharing your lens with us today because i think uh there there, there's many areas that i definitely would love to you know have you come back for like specifically the uh the insta or the social media fast that you're doing you know that one sounds like a a fascinating project i'm looking forward to uh you know seeing the four to five uh, part series you guys release on that yeah well thank you just so much not just for your time but really for preparing for this and for asking some excellent questions because uh yeah, we got pretty deep and now I'm feeling cognitively trashed because you made me, you pushed me and I appreciate you doing that. <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming on and uh, tell us how we can support you, how we can follow your journey and keep up with what you're up to. Yeah, it's a really timely question because this 30 day social media fast ends on Sunday and I don't know what I'm going to do Monday yet about it. So worst case, if I don't get back on at all, then uh, just philwhitebooks.com and I don't update it very regularly. But, it, you know, say someone wanted to ask me a question about the writing process or wanted to argue with me about something, there's a contact form on that website, philwhitebooks.com. So let's just do that for now and none of the social stuff because I don't know how that's going to play out going forward and neither does Kenny. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, yeah, I mean, just um, really just, in talking with you today about Jason's story and, and, and my late great father-in-law, John Stevens, his story, you know, I would just, if you want a kind of a heart-rending story, not to guilt you into buying the 17 hour fast, but I just think that it's not a book about fasting. It's a book about a, hitting a reset button in your life and using fasting as an on-ramp to, to reset some boundaries in your life and maybe look at something, say like food or like social media, or in my case, workaholism, um, that can trash your marriage, that can trash your relationships with your kids, that can, you know, if it's food, can can lead to obesity or food-related anxiety or what have you. Um, and, and it's just a reset slash of boundaries book. So if any of that sounds interesting, or indeed you just want a story that is really just coming from a place of a guy that's just trying to fulfill a legacy and a promise to his best friend before he passed away from brain cancer and and here's some techniques in this book that if you know someone with cancer maybe can help them if you know like my mother-in-law was knocking on the door of type 2 diabetes and just literally from doing this weekly fast she is now back in a normal blood sugar range and her doctor's like how did you manage that she's like well funny story so i'm not saying it's a magic bullet and um unlike most fasting or diet books we're not trying to sell you a line of supplements or anything else we're just trying to it's just, we're just beggars trying to share a piece of bed, bread with fellow beggars, basically. So if any of that sounds interesting, check out the 17-hour fast because I think um, hopefully it'll move you as much to to not only change your life but to be willing to make promises to people and fulfill them and to really look at how you can um, can share knowledge with people so that they, they can improve their life and fix some problems. So that's a long rambling plug. But, uh, yeah, just go check it out. No, that's great. We'll get all of that linked up in the show notes. Um, but thank you again, Phil, for uh, sharing this conversation with me. And uh, I hope to reconnect with you soon. No, my, my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Really feel blessed to be able to do this today. So yeah, thank you very much. And thanks everyone for listening. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate you lending me your ears. Before you head out, I wanted to share a free gift with you. It's only available for podcast listeners at MizHQ.com. Again, that's M-I-Z-H-Q.com. So go ahead and grab that. If you want to support the show, the best compliment that you can give is by leaving a review with your thoughts. You have no idea how much that helps, and I always love hearing from you guys. So once again, thank you again for tuning in. Until next time.